All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks to those of you who uh, attended the first session and are here for the second session. Um, let me introduce myself briefly and then uh, a couple of thank yous. So uh, my name is Osama Khalil. I'm a professor here in the history department and the organizer of today's symposium. Uh, I want to thank the previous panelists, but also uh, Hava and Lindsay who see circulating who are doing a phenomenal job. Couldn't do it without them. Um, and I already thanked our co-sponsors, but I'll thank them again just in, in general for sponsoring today's event. So the panel today, the second panel, builds on the discussion from this morning. And as I'm sure many of you know, there's hardly a day that goes by without a reference to rising authoritarianism or even fascism around the globe and at home. And as with our earlier discussion uh, in part one, the discussion of authoritarianism today will offer a transnational exploration of this topic. And we're going to examine the efforts from above and below to challenge authoritarianism, as well as some of the different stories and strategies involved in doing that. So I'm pleased to uh, introduce our distinguished panel, uh, from all from Syracuse, faculty from here and the Newhouse School. Uh, so we're going to start, start with uh, Demeter Gurgaev, who's an assistant professor of political science at Syracuse University. Uh, whether due to nostalgia or stubbornness, as Demeter tells us, he, uh, he originally comes from, hails from Bulgaria one of the several in the states that collapsed at the end of the 20th century that we talked about uh, in the morning. And he focuses his attention on the one big state that survived, the People's Republic of China, and its prospects, prospects for doing so into the future. Uh, Demeter's most current research concerns uh, the intersection between Leninist control institutions and modern technology in the PRC. Azar Hamadadech, how'd I do? Was that all right? <laughs> I was, I, I, was, I was doing okay. <laughs> I was really proud of myself for a second. Great job, dude. Right. Everybody butchers my name, it's okay. Uh, as an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology here at Syracuse, uh, she has research interests in the anthropology of international policy in the context of state making in post war Bosnia and Herzegovina. Her book, Citizens of an Empty Nation Youth and State Making in Post War Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, is an ethnographic investigation of the internationally directed post war intervention policies in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the response of local people to these policy efforts. She's also co-editor uh, of Care Across Distance Ethnographic Exp uh, Explorations of Aging and Migration. Christine Meda is a human rights investigator formerly with Amnesty International and Physicians for Human Rights. She has reported on a range of issues from national security, conflict, and war crimes to extractive industries, medical ethics, and criminal justice. She teaches classes at the intersection of journalism and human rights at the Newhouse School. Latif Tash is assistant professor and Marie Curie Global Fellow at the Maxwell School and at SOAS in the University of London, uh, where he obtained his PhD. Uh, I'm sorry, he obtained his PhD in law from Queen Mary University of London, and he's been writing on a comparative politics, social legal practices, gender and diaspora mobilization, uh, peace and conflict resolution in Europe and the Middle East, with special reference to the Kurds and Turks. He's the author of Legal Pluralism in Action, Dispute Resolution, and the Kurdish Peace Committee. And finally. Brian Taylor is a professor and chair of the political science department. He's written three books, uh, and his most recent book is The Code of Putinism, which was published last year. So please join me in welcoming our guests. So, Brian, can we start with you, um, just to kind of pick up on uh, the previous panel? Um, so we ended on kind of a somewhat hopeful note, right, with uh, the end of the Cold War, um, but the Soviet Union obviously doesn't survive, and so it dissolves within two years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Can you talk about that and how that sets up, in a way, authoritarianism, to authoritarianism today in Russia? Sure. Thanks, Osama. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, they already had made some steps towards liberalization and democratization with uh, a much freer press by the late 80s and early 90s than had been there previously, a series of elections at both the national and regional level in 1989 and 1990, uh, new freedom to protest, new freedom in the media, uh, et cetera. And I, I think the late 80s, early 90s was probably the period of uh, greatest euphoria about the prospects for uh, democratization around the world after the, the collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia. And if we look at sort of 
both cross-national and cross-temporal trends in democratization, the, the early to mid-90s is kind of the high point, and it kind of peaked there, and it's been fairly stable. If you look at ratings about the number of free or partly free countries around the world, it's been somewhat stable with a bit of a, a, a slight decline over the last uh, decade. And the trends in that part of the world are somewhat similar in that all of the countries at least announced an intention to democratize. Some of them had no intention to do so at all and never really became democratic. Uh, countries like Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, for example. Uh, others did embrace democracy and succeed in democratizing to a large extent. Uh, most uh, obviously here are the three Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And then if we look at the, the other states in the region, we see divergent tendencies. Uh, some countries like Georgia, like Armenia, uh, like Ukraine and Moldova, like Kyrgyzstan are, are what Freedom House would call sort of partly free countries. They have uh, a mix of democratic and authoritarian elements. Uh, and then we have countries more down towards the authoritarian end of the spectrum, such as uh, Russia, uh, Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, et cetera. So uh, in, in terms of Russia, uh, in some senses it was seen a, as perhaps a, a good bet for democratization simply because the society, uh, unlike the society that existed when the Soviet Union was founded, was, was highly urban, highly literate, uh, highly educated, uh, and had some of those uh, sort of basic uh, social um, tendencies that sometimes go along with more open uh, political systems. And in the 90s, they, they, they struggled to create stable institutions that by the end of the 1990s uh, were seen as somewhat weak, but still offering quite a bit of pluralism and liberalism and probably most notably when they had elections in the 1990s in Russia, no one knew who was going to win in advance. Uh, that, that obviously is not the case anymore, and after uh, Vladimir Putin became president in 2000, there's been a fairly consistent trajectory in a more authoritarian direction. Uh, we now know who's going to win the elections long before they happen. Uh, the space for alternative uh, political parties, alternative opposition movements is uh, quite restricted, although they do have some uh, space to organize. So uh, when people talk about the tendency towards authoritarianism around the world, Putin is often sort of number one, two, or three on the list of sort of exhibit A. Uh, and this sometimes leads to a broader discussion about whether there's kind of an authoritarian international where they all work together to try and spread authoritarianism. And I think I'll leave that issue to, to further in the discussion. Thank you. So I, I want to turn, Azra, to you, and, and we'll get your uh, presentation set up. But um, the other story at the end of 89, and really kind of as we get into the 90s, it was touched on, it, 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 is about the class of Yugoslavia that kind of sets up your, your research. So hoping you can talk a little bit about that. I knew Brian would be here, so I took it. Hello, just push. Oh, okay. Can you hear me okay? Um, when I was invited to come to join this panel, I asked myself, why? Why was I invited? I don't do authoritarianism. But then now I know because it's because Osama wanted to say my last name in public. So, uh, And also we needed to add some accents to this event. So here I am. Um, uh, so I'm just very quickly, and we agreed in our uh, exchanges that putting a map up when it comes to Yugoslavia, it's always a good thing. So here I am uh, with a map of uh, very colorful six uh, former Yugoslav republics from Slovenia all the way in northwest, all the way down to Macedonia in southeast. So the former Yugoslavia, uh, and this is the second Yugoslavia, I'm not going to talk about the first one, no time for that one. Uh, so the, the second Yugoslavia lasted uh, between 43 and 91. It was a federation of six republics, and it's kind of well known in the world for its fa famous uh, president, Josip Broz Tito, who is sometimes described as dictator and sometimes is seen as a savior. It depends who you're talking to in the region. Um, it was, as I said, federation of six, six republics from Slovenia to Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, with two autonomous regions, Kosovo and Vojvodina, Montenegro and Macedonia. One of the main postulates of this regime was the notion of bratstvo and jedinstvo, meaning brotherhood and unity, that all ethnic groups in Yugoslavia should peacefully coexist, intermix, 
and nurtured the notion of intermarriage. Well, kind of intermarriage policy was was not always consistent, but and um, and cross ethnic affiliation. And this was done and delivered and taught in schools. I'm a product of this regime, and I'm happy to talk about that um, through schools and the army, which was compulsory for all males um, in the country. Uh, another thing that Tito is famous for, and when I teach a class in the Balkans, my students always say, more Tito. They're just fascinated that high schools in this country don't teach about Tito. Uh, is that Tito was also the head of the non-aligned movement together with uh, Nehru and Nasser that uh, brought together 120 developing countries in the world that didn't want to side with either West or, uh, the US or Russia during the uh, USSR during the Cold War. Um, uh, Bosnia, uh, Yugoslavia was in some accounts, according to some accounts, and this is where it connects really beautifully to the previous panel, was seen in some, um, in, in many people's eyes as one that's what the best positioned to transition to peacefully to peace and democracy among all Eastern European countries. Well, if you followed CNN uh, in the 1990s, it didn't go that way. There are many reasons why people say this happened. The most popular uh, uh, account is to say, well, you know, Tito didn't really succeed to keep nationalism down. Nationalism was bubbling. Once he dies, nationalism explodes. I think that's a very simplistic way to look at what happened. We see there's a larger global re restructuring. Um, Yugoslavia faced a huge economic crisis in the 80s. We heard about so, uh, workers' protests. Uh, this was a very common occurrence in Yugoslavia. Um, and you know, national nationalism was part of the landscape, but it was not the, no the dominant or the only story. This was a very modern war about political power and territory. Um, so Slobodan Milosevic, I don't think he actually entered the field as a nationalist. He became a nationalist. He was mobilizing the nationalist tendencies, but he didn't, co didn't come to politics as a nationalist. So Bosnia is something I was asked to talk a little bit more about. It was one of those uh, Yugoslav republics that was seen as the one that cannot witness the war because it's so intermixed. Well, the war was forceful unmixing of peoples. And oftentimes now we think about the Bosnian war which lasted between 92 and 95 as the war between three groups, Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, and Bosniaks. I think this is again a simplification and ethnicization of the conflict itself. Um, these kinds of visions of Bosnia are product of the war, not the cause of the war in my opinion. Um, what's famous about Bosnia is that in a country that has less than four million people and is half the size of Iceland, um, 104,000 uh, uh, um, uh, lives were uh, lost and two out of four million people were uprooted, which is a horrific thing to, to experience, but it's a great thing if you travel around the world, you have Bosnians to stay with wherever you go, which I use a lot. Um, the Dayton Peace Agreement was uh, brought the end to the Bosnian War, and it uh, was signed in a much cooler place than Dayton, Ohio, which is called Paris, um, and on December 1495. And what it did in Bosnia is it, it, it installed uh, something called consociational democracy, and it's a power-sharing regime, which divided a country, uh, which institutionalized ethnicity on a sub-state level. And what it did is uh, create, from a country that was territorially very intermixed, it created kind of uh, in a, a, a country where ethnic people, it delivered a vision where ethnic people are rooted in ethnic territories. So it was divided into the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina with 51% of the territory and Republika Srpska with 49, which is largely uh, centralized. Then Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina is divided into 10 cantons. I'm personally from Canton 1. I studied in Canton 7. And these are uh, also largely autonomous. Um, and then three of which are kind of intermixed. The rest of them are ethnically homogenous. And then there is Republika Srpska with 49% of territory. Then they couldn't agree about the Bučko district in the north, and that's a self-governing unit. What does this mean? It means hell in terms of political organization of the country. You think you have it hard with one president. Try with three. So it's a very complicated constitutional arrangement where um, in order to balance very competing claims uh, from three different fractions during the war that emerged as the only fractions that, um, that could negotiate at the end of the war because opposition was disabled at the beginning and through the war. So um, in order to do that, 
um, one nominally central government was created with three presidents who rotate every eight months, one of them becomes the president. We don't, I don't know who is today. To be honest, it, they rotate every eight months and they're, they're elected for four years. Um, three presidents, two chambers of parliament and one council of ministers, two entities, one special district and 10 ethnically based cantons all according to ideology of ethnic people rooted in ethnic territories, uh, what Campbell called famously eth enclave multi-ethnicity. Yeah, you have multi-ethnicity, but it's actually everyone in their own little uh, places. Um, state bureaucracy is massive. It consumes in more than 50% of the annual GP um, uh, gross domestic product. Um, and also it employs the majority of people. So as we heard previous, in the previous panel, um, these places uh, in, in nationalist governments that control them become spaces also of employment and nepotism and clientelism. And you know, if Bosnians are voting, voting for nationalists, it's not necessarily because they're nationalists, it's because they want a job. Um, and um, I think I'll probably come to this one, but I wanted to say just that in terms of, um, in terms of this bureaucratic government, it's so huge. Uh, at some point you have 13 levels of governance making, which is ideal for um, corruption, it's, it's uh, ideal for all sorts of ma maneuverings, um, and at the same time, it's uh, making citizens detach themselves from the state. So even though you have such a massive state, I claim the state itself is empty. So I hope I can come to that in a little bit. I want to give floor to others. Um, but one thing I want to say as an, uh, as an anthropologist is that my biggest question, uh, and, I want, and, and what this kind of, one more slide, and then I'll uh, let the next person talk. Um, uh, Bosnia can be uh, seen as a fragmented and fractured authoritarian state um, because the question is still what prevented really Bosnia from becoming this democratic um, state that would you know, uh, peacefully transition to democracy and capitalism. Uh, one of the political scientists who is an expert the, on the region said that while the old state is old, and I want to say this because it was mentioned in the previous panel as well, the old regime never did. Late Yugoslav communist establishment mutated into ethno-nationalist cliques. Um, so this, there is a massive ideological transformation, but actually when it comes to the nature of the rule, it's very similar. It's just fragmented on the sub-state level. So, while the benefits of the socialist state, state are all but gone. And this ironically is done under the umbrella of democratization and peace and supported by the democracy structures. So um, I'll skip that. So uh, this also allow for all sorts of you know, corruptions and, and business deals to take place within bureaucracy called demo democracy. Um, the main question is what does it mean to live in this kind of state? This is an anthropological question. How people deal with this? And I hope I can come to that later, if there's time. So um, moving from Azra to a state that did not dissolve, right? Um, and Demeter with China. Can you talk a little about that? We talked a lot about Tiananmen Square and, and just a little bit after Tiananmen Square, but the persistence and some of the features of authoritarian rule. Uh, Jeremy in the last panel talked about, you know, for about two years afterwards, spring of 89 was asked about in questionnaires. So could you just kind of describe for us how it compares also to Russia and the fragmented authoritarianism of Bosnia and Herzegovina in a way? Okay. I, um, I, don't know, I, I don't know if I can address all of those yeah. right now, but I'm I'll definitely come to them at some point. Um, so these were, um, uh, first of all, thank you, Osama, for including me. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of this. Um, I think that the, the first two speakers gave us a lot of uh, um, uh, wonderful information. I learned a lot. And so I'm going to come in um, and offer kind of a, a more simple um, uh, impression of, of what I think is, is happening in China today. And I, uh, I didn't really bring um, very careful slides. I brought some pictures that I, that I hope will convey some of the ideas, uh, and you can let me know. So the first one I wanted to show you is, is this image of um, the, the Communist Party house in, in Bulgaria. It's, it's, a, it's a, a massive building. People call it kind of the UFO structure, um, but it's it's a massive building that is um, positioned right in the middle of, of, of Bulgaria in um, kind of the, the mountains of uh, the central forest region. And if you 
kind of take a, a yardstick and, and you go in every direction. It's basically in the middle of, of every kind of edge of China. Uh, not China. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, and it was it was commissioned um, in the 1970s. It was built in the 1980s. It was just it was a tremendous um, architectural endeavor. It was extremely expensive. I think um, um, at that point it would, it would have been on the odds of 30 or 50 million dollars to build this in a, in a country that really didn't have too many resources. Um, and you can tell by the way it's structured. It's um, it's 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 a circle. It's an oval. Um, there's there's windows all around, um, and and you can kind of see the whole country because it's on top of a uh, of a of a mountain peak, um, and it and it has a, a an important history. It was it was the place where the first kind of um, serious battle against Ottoman rule happened. It was also the the place where the first kind of socialist party meetings happened. And so it has a, a huge history. But then again, it's in the middle of the country. It's far removed from the main cities, which are Sofia. Um, and Varna on, on, on kind of on the opposite coast of the country. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was kind of detached, but nevertheless it was supposed to symbolize the centralization of the, of the Bulgarian Communist Party um, and the fact that it, 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 it governed the entire country and represented all groups, all ethnic groups, all religious groups. Um, um, and, and it was all part of one house, uh, one Communist Party. And yet when you see this image today, what you can, you can obviously tell is um, nobody's been there for quite a long time. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's kind of collapsed. Uh, the state doesn't, doesn't really um, do anything to maintain it. Uh, tourists go and visit, um, but also you know, artists, uh, um, um, movie producers, junkies, whoever it is, uh, skateboarders love to go. So it's, it's just kind of a, a, an empty monument. And I think it symbolizes um, kind of what happened with the Bulgarian Communist Party in the 1980s is that in its grandeur, in its, in its effort to kind of convey the centralized control, um, it, it revealed some of the emptiness it had as a, um, as a communist system, as a, as a party system. Um, at, at the same time as this monument was being built, this, this grand house of, of centralized communist unity was, was being built, the grassroots of the Bulgarian Communist Party were already starting to, to, to wither. Um, Communist Party cells across Bulgaria were little more than kind of clubs of privilege. And the understanding by the mid-1980s and into the latter 1980s of what the Bulgarian people actually thought or felt or wanted uh, was not really getting through, in my opinion, um, to, to the Bulgarian Communist Party. And we have statistics on this about um, the Central Communist Party in Bulgaria, uh, access to information about public opinion, access to information about what, what the public is doing. And even in my own family, I, I have a story. So my, my father was a low-ranking party member uh, who enjoyed kind of the privileges of, of being a low-ranking party member um, and met in, in party committee meetings. And my mother was a um, democracy activist and organizer. <laughs> so on Saturday, you know, we would go and enjoy kind of the party pass uh, at, the, at, the, at the ski area that was reserved for only for party members. And on Sunday, my mother would be organizing sit-ins and, and, and uh, street blockages. And, and nobody really found out about this and complained to my father until about two or three years into it. And then by, by that time, we had already kind of made, made arrangements to, 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 to leave the country. But again, this, this grandeur of, of, of centralized uh, and, and kind of... Uh, um, peripheral vision that the Communist Party tried to convey with this building really belied a disconnectedness um, that, it, that it had with the, with the people um, leading up to um, 1989 and 1991 later on. So another picture. <clears throat> this is the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. And um, you, can, you can tell that there's some similarities in architecture. <laughs> uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grand building. Um, it can seat um, over 30,000 people in, in, its, in its various different conference rooms um, and uh, the main hall here. Um, so it's, it, it has that kind of same sense of centralized rule um, and, and everybody is part of the process, whether it's um, ethnic groups in Tibet or in, in Xinjiang, um, workers or intellectuals, 
uh, farmers um, and, and artisans. Everybody's kind of represented in a centralized communist body. Um, and the question is, I guess for me, is, is it disconnected uh, the way the Bulgarian Communist Party was um, in, in, in the 1980s? And my, my answer on this is, I, I'm not going to give a complete answer right now, and hopefully I'll be able to come back and, and argue with myself <laughs> a, a little bit later, but the beginning of my answer is no. Um, I think that what happened in 1989 in China was a reflection of the party um, um, kind of underinvesting in grassroots organization and, and grassroots control. Um, the 1980s, as some of you may know, was a period of uh, rapid kind of experimentation um, and liberalization, at least on the economic side. But it was also a moment of kind of political uncertainty as well. And, and, um, I, I wasn't part, uh, I wasn't here for the whole first panel, but my impression of, of what happened in 1989 uh, was, was as much a kind of an indication of the, of, of the communist leadership and Deng Xiaoping um, being firm and, and convinced about the future and where the party needed to go, as much as it was about being scared about what was happening across the country. Um, and the fact that for the first time, you had groups of various uh, interest of various background coming together and challenging the regime at the same time. And you have people within the Chinese Communist Party, even within the top leadership, um, um, starting to disagree with a, a, a central voice and, and a unified message. I think that that's what scared them. And the response was um, an impressive investment in trying to reconsolidate the party and reconnect to the, uh, to the public. Here's another picture. Um, I have only one more picture after this, so I'll stop. But this is a picture of a um, complaints bureau monitoring station in Shanghai. And what you're seeing here is um, um, kind of instantaneous statistics of who's saying what and where, who's complaining, uh, where there's some sort of issue within one district of, of the city. And there are people that are employed um, to monitor this along with CCTV cameras, constantly trying to figure out um, not only is, is, is there some sort of uh, dissident behavior going on, but is there any sort of uh, tension going on, social tension, any sort of uh, um, um, situation where authorities need to intervene, and it's happening um, instantaneously, um, and, and, and the authorities can basically micromanage uh, society to an extent that, you know, I think the Communist Party in Bulgaria or, or, or even the Soviet Union would have dreamed to have had um, in, in the 1960s and 70s. And indeed, they were trying to. Um, a lot of the, the famous computer scientists that, that we know of today, were some of them were, were, were working with um, um, the Soviet um, kind of in, in intelligentsia and engineers to try and develop a system where they could monitor society. But, you know, they were, they were I think, ahead of their time a little bit. Um, but China has this system now, and it's going even further. Um, so this is my last image of, of um, what people kind of have started to refer to as digital Leninism. Or it's, um, it has to do with the social credit system in China, where basically every individual now is going to carry around them a, what you might think of as your FICO score. Right? Uh, but it's not simply based on your behavior um, uh, financially and, and, your, and your credit worthiness. It's also... Um, you know, do you, do you get home too late at night and drink too much? Are you too loud? Um, do, you, do, you, do you drive your car a little bit recklessly? Um, do you uh, maybe not uh, visit your parents on, on holidays? And you, you can ask yourself, well, how would they know this? Well, part of the way the system is integrated is not only does this information get communicated upwards to, to the government instantaneously, but it's also communicated by your friends. Uh, by your neighbors, by your colleagues who are asked and encouraged to rate you, to, uh, to report on you. Um, this type of, uh, of, of connection, and I, and I don't mean it in a good sense, but understanding of what's going on in society is, I think, a new kind of authoritarianism that is, that is pretty unique, um, at, at least at this point, to the Chinese case. And I think it's, gonna, it's contributing to its, its resilience uh, but again, I wanted to, I, I'll, I'll try and argue against myself a little bit later, uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.
Christine, do you want to talk about some of talk about India and the features of authoritarianism that, that you're observing um, in India today? Sure. Yeah, and um, I had a few slides that I can also kind of pop up. Okay, so I'm actually, I'm actually going to start a little bit later in my presentation now that I've heard some of the other um, speakers go. So I'm going to talk from a slightly different perspective. Um, I'm not an academic. I don't study this from an academic perspective. Um, but I, when I speak on these sorts of things, I tend to speak on it from the perspective of a journalist and an activist. Um, so I spent about four years working in India for Amnesty International right as the national elections uh, were happening in 2014, um, which the national elections uh, now actually just started yesterday in India. Um, so during that time, you know, as, as somebody who was working um, kind of in the civil society space in India, you know, we started to notice um, some interesting trends and just kind of some new shrinking of civic space that we hadn't really experienced in the past. So when I speak on this, um, I tend to look at it from what does civic space look like around the world? And this is a really interesting open source project um, called Civicus, which looks at um, the number of attacks that have been perpetrated against activists and journalists around the world. Um, and so they've started doing this in the past couple years, and it's a really interesting data source to kind of look at you know, where, where is civic space being obstructed around the world? And you can see in the case of India, you know, we have some growing obstruction compared to what this map looked like 10 years ago. Um, and this is just another chart looking at kind of the type of kind of what we call attacks on civic space. So use of excessive force, detention of activists, attacks on journalists, um, and especially legislative restrictions, which is something that um, we've seen popping up, especially in South Asia. Um, South Asia leads the world in terms of placing new legislative restrictions, especially on the funding of NGO activity in these countries, which um, has proved over the past five years to become very problematic in India and has been the subject of international condemnation. So I'm going to go back to the beginning here. So yesterday um, was the start of the 2019 national elections in India. So India has this reputation of being one of the largest uh, democracies in the world. Um, thriving, pluralistic, um, you know, the national elections in India are often called the largest electoral spectacle uh, in the world. There are about 900 million people that are expected to vote. Um, so, but what's interesting about this is that, you know, the national conversation right now in India is, this is a national referendum on democracy. Democracy is at stake in India. And I think what's interesting about how quickly the rhetoric has changed over the past five years since the BJP and Narendra Modi came into power is the fact that you know, how could the largest democracy in the world all of a sudden become part of the conversation around authoritarianism? So why India? And does it really have to do with the entrance of the BJP and Narendra Modi um, into power in 2014? So a lot of it does have to do, from the civil society perspective, a lot of it does have to do with the election of the BJP and Narendra Modi into power. Um, Narendra Modi is kind of your classic strongman. He is a nationalist. He has deep ties to the Hindu right. Um, he, he loves Twitter, so he loves to attack his, he loves to attack his rivals on Twitter. Um, you know, he kind of really displays a lot of those bombastic qualities that we expect to see from a strong man. Um, and it's been able, and um, it has kind of served to really empower um, a lot of kind of vigilantism and mob violence in India that uh, wasn't present previously. And a lot of it has to do with the history of the BJP. The BJP was established in 1951. It is the foil to the Congress Party, which was kind of a big tent umbrella party um, that is known for secularism, is known for pluralism, um, also plagued by horrific scandal and corruption, um, unfortunately, which really allowed for space for the BJP to step in. The BJP grew out of uh, an organization called the RSS, which was established in 1921, um, which is really synonymous with the concept of what's called Hindutva, which is the concept of a Hindu nation. So when the BJP was campaigning and it became clear that they were going to win an outright majority in parliament, it created a lot of concern for a lot of us in the civil society community because most of us knew that periods of BJP power have been equated with repression of minorities, repression of activists, and repression of leftist causes. Um, so this is a picture of the RSS for those that are not familiar. Um, one of the specific examples of kind of state repression that we've been seeing over the past couple of years is uh, most recently the National Register of Citizens, which is happening in Assam. Uh, 
So if this goes through, this will represent the single largest uh, voter disenfranchisement uh, initiative in history. So what, they're, what the government is doing is they are establishing a national register, um, specifically in Assam, for people to be able to vote, but it's disproportionately um, affecting um, Muslims who are living in Assam who do not have documentation and are unable to register, but who have been residing in the state for decades. Often their families have been living there for um, many, many years. So that's one example, um, and really playing on this kind of uh, uh, xenophobic um, sort of sentiment and uh, um, resistance from the Hindu majority in Assam. So another sign of kind of growing repression that we've been seeing over the past few years is kind of the rise of these vigilante groups in Cal protection. So Human Rights Watch has reported that 44 people have been killed over the past five years, um, specifically related to kind of perceived breaches of uh, protection of cows, which are legally protected in India, but um, primarily mobs have been targeting groups um, like Dalits, which are kind of the lowest caste in India within the Hindu system, and Muslims as well. Um, and this is a hate crime watch um, organization that started up in India, and they've been tracking open source kind of the number of hate crimes against minorities that have been perpetrated over the past 10 years or so. And they've noticed uh, of the 252 um, incidents that they've recorded since 2008, 90% 90, 90 of them occurred after the 2014 election when Narendra Modi and the BJP came into power. So what's interesting about this is that a lot of people say, well, can this really be linked to the BJP? Can this really be linked to kind of regime or administration change in India? And Modi is a very interesting politician because a lot, a lot of can't directly be attributed to him because he's never actually given a press conference in India. He's never spoken out publicly in India about any of these uh, particular situations, about the killings of secular academics, about mob violence, um, about growing vigilantism, because um, that's something that he's done even since he was a chief minister in Gujarat. Um, in 2002, he was chief minister of the state whenever there was the largest example of communal violence in which nearly 2,000 Muslims were killed. He's never spoken out publicly against that. There have been court cases um, to try and uh, establish kind of liability for his administration at the time. None have been successful, and he's gone after groups that have continued to file litigation against him. So all of this to say is that, again, why India? India, we have this concept of India as this really pluralistic um, kind of uh, democratic nation, and historically speaking, it is a country um, that hasn't necessarily exhibited signs of authoritarianism. Um, there have been periods in the past, like Indira Gandhi's emergency in 1975, and a history of um, kind of restrictive surveillance over civil society and activists and, and journalists. Um, but in 2014, it really did usher in this new era of kind of national conversation and national questioning of, is this a period of growing illiberalism? Is this a growing period of authoritarianism that we haven't really seen before in this country. And so I don't really have a good answer for that. I think as somebody who um, you know, was present at the time when some of these actions started to take place, um, organizing NGOs like, in, like Amnesty International and Greenpeace had their assets frozen. Several organizations have been forced to shut down. Um, I think that it's, it's been a real challenge to, um, to understand uh, you know, how kind of the shrinking of civic space is either representative of authoritarianism or liberalism or not. Um, but I think that's something that I will allow and defer to some of my colleagues who study these things from a more academic perspective to debate and discuss. But in terms of India's place and kind of the leadership that it represents in the region, um, it has always been kind of a beacon of democracy, of democracy and liberalism um, within the region. Uh, but some of that is changing at this point. Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar have always been classified as flawed democracies or hybrid regimes by people like Freedom House or um, The Economist. And India has always kind of been um, a place of refuge for people who have fled some of these other more restrictive regimes. But the concern is, is that it's changing. And so I, my, the question that I have as somebody who worked there and as somebody who works as a journalist and, and as an activist is, 
you know, is there enough, is there enough focus on a place like India who has this reputation of liberalism and of kind of still functioning democracy, but is that democracy really as functional as we think it is? Latif, thank you, Christine. Uh, so we'll move over to Turkey now, which has a very different history than, than India, effectively. And I'm wondering if you can walk us through some of that and some of the features of Erdogan's rule in Turkey and, and authoritarianism in Turkey and how much of that can be historically rooted and, and how much of that's more recent. First of all, I would like to thank Osman for organizing this actually timely, important uh, discussion for us. And I'm happy to come back again here, which I described home last three years. Uh, when we look at uh, authoritarianism in Turkey, especially today, and many of you might think actually it's a new uh, phenomenon, it's new something which is Erdogan has started, which is not. When just uh, from 1920, when Mustafa Kemal Atatürk established his rule in Turkey, the promises he's, he made, and also 2002, when AKP government comes to power, uh, power, and when Erdogan makes promises, the six promises, when I compare them, it's so similar. The first of all, 1920, when, uh, after the Ottoman when collapse and independent Turkish war was successfully won, but Turkish state was divided by Western power as a part of the Serb Ser agreement. This Serb agreement always stayed there and has been there as a mind of Turkish peoples uh, and uh, governments and as a way monopolize their power when they, any authoritarian regimes keep point that agreement. If they don't follow the strong rule, what's going to happen in the country, the country is going to be divided and be uh, lose. Atatürk 1920s, he promised a strong Turkish state, but also he promised a new pluralistic constitution. Uh, promised multiple parties, 1920, to establish democratic values, to respect freedom of people, respect freedom of speech, to have a zero problems with neighbors, which Atatürk claimed that the Yurtasul, Cihan Dasul, to have peace inside, to have peace with the world, and to find a peaceful resolution with Kurds, which 1920s was described by Atatürks. But exactly similar promises, 2002, Erdogan come to power, he claimed exactly similar promise. To have new pluralistic constitution, res uh, to, to respect rule of law, to have zero problems with neighbors, to find a peaceful resolution with the Kurds, and, but none of them, after almost 100 years pass, has been reached in, in Turkey. And between the governments, between Atatürk 1920s and Erdogan's present days, almost all Turkish government follow one or another way similar structure of authoritarianism. There are always the body of this authoritarianism, the state unity is the center of the part of that uh, claim. The second one has been used the religion. Sunni Islam has been divide, uh, ruling and uh, monopolizing public behind these authoritarian regimes. The third, to have a strong uh, connection with the rest of the world, liberal economy, from even 1920s to present days, open liberal economy. That's the reason you always find Turkish authorities a bit soft because it is, is described as soft from the Western perspective because the economic value always has been open to Western. And there is not any limit, limitation to other countries to come to do business. And of course, the other aspect is nationalism, especially Turkish nationalism. This has been the main body of Turkish authoritarianism from Atatürk to present days. Has been slightly different perspective 
which sometimes has taken secular, militarist perspective, which was from Atatürk time especially, but today, Islamist perspective. The sometimes the body has taken the left arm of secularism, which is slightly respecting the, the minority's right, at least showing, respecting the woman's right, in at least on the, on the propaganda level, but 1960s and present days under Erdogan's uh, regimes has been taken part of Islamist way. But the state is at center always, and the, the main aim has been always that protected state unitary structure. I think this not just start from Atatürk, which Ottoman uh, ideology when, uh, when the state collapsed, but ideology was still there and still is present days. The Atatürk, I think, analyzed Turkey, uh, Ottoman system very well, and they kept the important aspect, which is very strong, centralist aspect of the Ottoman power, but also eliminate all other aspects. For example, independent religious institution was eliminated taken religious under the state authority. State was in charge of religion. And the re minority's right or institution was eliminated because was seen the main aspect of the collapse of Ottomans, which is military system, you, you probably have heard about it. And the, the Kurdish minorities was always, when they come to difficult times, the promises is given to Kurds for peaceful resolution. When you look at 1919, 1920, when the war, independent war was going on, especially when you look at, analyze Atatürk's speech in, in the city of Turkey, Eskişehir, he, he gave long interviews to journalists, and that, interv that inf interview, I think, the one of them, the most progressive, pluralistic interview you have ever seen, Atatürk given right to oppositions, right to minorities, and right to Kurds because there was difficult times and he needed support of Kurds. But similar things, 2012, 2013, when there was a long, uh, intensive conflict started in the Middle East and affected many other countries, like uh, from Egypt to Bahrain, and Syria went to, into that crisis, Turkey felt threatened because there was a Gezi movement in uh, uh, 2013. And again, state perspective want to eliminate one of the biggest threat of the country, which was Kurds. The threat was uh, uh, postponed by the promising a peace process, so-called peace process to Kurds. And state successfully brought all Kurdish Moments and activists, it pacified for two years under the peace process. But by 2015, already the danger in the Middle East passed. The, the system in Egypt and Tunisia already taken different shape. And Turkey was already in strong position to crack down Kurds and to postpone its promises again. Because, but this also has, you know, connected with the Western power. Because Turkey doesn't do just this one because of they want to do that. The environment around the world, the global environment, uh, 2012, 2013, for Middle East perspective, you start war to recognize, to respect minorities' rights, to respect opposition rights. And the, the Western powers, you know, when you were hearing from Obama, from Merkel, or from uh, David Cameron, they were uh, giving space to others. But this environment today is not, doesn't exist. Europe has a their own authoritarianism system, which they, we talked about it in uh, Hungary, in France, in the United Kingdom, which I live, there's a strong of 
right-wing authoritarianism. Well, there's a right-wing authoritarianism. Erdogan benefited from this one and used uh, as a way crack down every opposition in Turkey. We don't have any parliament anymore in Turkey. The role of, uh, role of power, parliament is very limited, as like 1920s when Mustafa Kemal won the, the war, he eliminated opposition parties. Multiple parties was destroyed and eliminated by 1924, which Erdogan exactly did similar things today. The main opposition groups in Turkey are women organizations, Kurdish groups, and also some liberal elements. But when you look at today to them, almost all Kurdish political activists, leaders, they are in prison. And main liberal voices, like writers, journalists, they are in prison. And most of them are outside the country. And there is not any opposition in Turkey exists today, because you only hear the monopolized media monopolize governments and actually make elections meaningless. Last year when I was teaching here, the, the first things I told my students, please don't describe elections part of the democratic value. If any of you describe this one, you will be failed. Because the election is not, and we are by mistakenly describing and over and over, election is not democracy. If it was democracy, then Hitler, from Hitler to Saddam's, and from Putin to Erdogan, all of them are very well elected democratic leaders. Because they only become, if election in Turkey, for example, especially last 10 years, the monopolized media monopolize uh, the legal system under one party, almost no rule of parliament, doesn't matter how many elections you take, it will, the result is the same. Or if they win some places like a small towns or big towns, then they won't respect it. They will replace it with one of the dead guy, which is happening in today. For example, city of Istanbul, after 25 years, the Erdogan's party won election, uh, lost elections. But almost 10 days has passed. They haven't given right to opposition candidate to rule the city. They are recounting and recounting and making new votes, making sure that the guys win the elections. Many other Kurdish cities who has just last week won the elections, straight away replaced with second candidate with Erdogan's party. If there is any hope in Turkey's or space, I think we can discuss this one more uh, later time, part of question time. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to pick up on Latif's a couple of points and turn to Brian. And Brian, you mentioned that uh, you know Russia is often seen as kind of the, the mothership of, of authoritarianism, for lack of a better term. But are there some features that, that you can pick out that perhaps connect to some of the others? So Latif and Christine, for instance, talked about targeting of minorities um, and, and how much that has played into authoritarianism, whether it's the Kurds or Muslims in India or, some, or the Dalits. What are some of the features from, from Russia and how is it, of its authoritarianism that are either exported abroad or that it has picked up on from some others that you can maybe draw out? So in terms of features of Russian authoritarianism, one of them that's quite widespread is that um, it pretends to be a democracy. So it has a constitution that was adopted in 1993 and has many elements of both liberalism and democratic in it, including a, a series of checks and balances and countervailing institutions. Uh, so what's happened over time is all those institutions continue to exist, uh, but they've been hollowed out. So the, the horizontal ones that are supposed to check executive power in terms of uh, the legislature and the courts have been brought largely under the control of the executive branch. Uh, the vertical institutions that are also supposed to hold the central government to account in terms of regional governments have all uh, largely been brought under central control in terms of how governors are selected and uh, the dominance of the, the United Russia Party at the regional level. And then uh, the sort of ultimate um, 
vertical check on power that's supposed to exist, uh, which is uh, elections on the part of the people, have been uh, converted to a form of elections which aren't free and fair. So uh, I'm going to take exception as a political scientist with what Latif said about uh, elections and democracy. I mean, elections are uh, a necessary but not sufficient part of democracy. It depends on the nature of the elections. So uh, the shortest definition of democracy that I know that makes sense to me is democracy is a political system in which parties lose elections. And if you unpack that, you can see why all those, each word in that is a necessary part of the definition. Uh, so it requires elections in which there's free competition between different parties, in which there's a more or less level playing field, and there's enough space for uh, media freedom and organization for elections to take place that are meaningful in that sense. So that's a necessary part. Uh, so Russia has elections, and one of the, the big tendencies since um, the end of the Cold War is, is the rise of these kind of hybrid regimes in which there's competitive authoritarianism. So elections are allowed to take place, just the opposition is never allowed to win. And that's a feature uh, in Russia that uh, Russia didn't pioneer by any means, but I, I think it's been become one of the most important uh, aspects of contemporary authoritarianism. Uh, in terms of some of the other elements, uh, certainly there have been uh, important restrictions placed on media, important restrictions placed on civil society. Uh, so, for example, state television is heavily controlled from the Kremlin. There are actually weekly meetings in the presidential administration with the editors of the main television channels to tell them what the uh, primary issues that they're supposed to talk about on television are for the week. Uh, in terms of civil society, the, the government has a kind of dual policy. Uh, so those organizations that try and organize in a more political kind of space are, are restricted, harassed, uh, given the label of being foreign agents and so on, whereas other or civil society organizations are actually quite encouraged because uh, if they're in the space of, for example, um, providing uh, social support for veterans or for people with disabilities or orphans or things like that, that's encouraged as a supplement to what the state provides because state administration often fails in those sorts of tasks. And so centralized grants are provided by the Kremlin to help sort of bolster those kind of social services. Uh, certainly there are attacks on journalists. Some of them uh, are, are quite well known in opposition activists, but for the most part, uh, they pursue a, a more clever strategy of low intensity coercion. So they don't feel the need to uh, necessarily go out and shoot and imprison lots of people. Uh, they prevent access to the ballot. Uh, people who become problematic uh, spend part of their time sitting in prison and the fact that they have a criminal charge against them means they're not eligible to, to run an election. Uh, so they have a more kind of uh, sophisticated perhaps uh, form of authoritarianism than simply brute force, but one that is quite effective in limiting the space uh, to opponents of the regime. Now, there are other areas where there is more freedom. For example, in contrast to China, for example, the internet is quite free uh, in Russia, and the opposition is heavily represented there, and probably the best known opposition figure is a guy named Alexei Navalny, who uh, has several elements of his campaign, but the most effective one are anti-corruption videos, where they expose uh, how wealthy some of the people around Putin have become and how they managed to do this, and these uh, videos get millions of views on YouTube, and, and people know about them and talk about them, uh, but it's never allowed to cross over into uh, the sort of more dominant mainstream television network. So one of the big issues going forward is whether there will be a more concerted effort to crack down on the internet. There uh, are a series of legislative initiatives right now that they're talking about that would create a so-called sovereign internet that would try and detach it a bit from the rest of the internet. And that's probably the most worrying uh, development because it would uh, eliminate that space that has existed uh, throughout the Putin era for more opposition and liberal-minded uh, voices to be to be heard by the, the rest of the population. Thank you. Azra, you, you, you described a, a different form, which was fascinating, kind of this, uh, and I'm curious how much the, the fear of chaos is used in, as an authoritarian feature. Um, referencing the Bosnian War, uh, 
but then also some of the other features that may be drawn on, including you mentioned that this a very broad bureaucracy that, that it actually allows a lot of corruption within the society. And what other features it may, that uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina may draw on from, from the other examples we've heard? Um, thank you for that. Um, just to piggyback on something that Ryan, uh, Ryan said, I think what's unique in, in the Bosnian case is that uh, this huge bureaucracy and post-war order uh, created also um, unimaginable unemployment rate, which is 60% uh, uh, when it comes to the youth and 40% when it comes to um, uh, adult population, which is actually also a space through which some of these uh, kind of less brutal forms of uh, control are being exercised because people, if they, want to, uh, if they want to have jobs, they are invited to go to the elections but to vote for the predictable candidate. So a lot of this is done through this kind of pressure to uh, show loyalty in order to get a job because bureaucracy is so huge and it's the only employer. So I would say this is kind of a, another twist um, to what uh, Brian has said. Uh, has said um, also a lot what is happening in Bosnia in this in in, in this uh, fragmented extremely fragmented chaotic system um, any form of resistance is then captured and rearticulated as an intra-ethnic form of violence or hatred so this is the way in which these oligarchs who are in power who are all ethno-nationalist leaders who have been legitimized through the process of peace building which is ironic but um, this is how they control a lot of resistance because as soon as there is certain kind of res and there is resistance on the ground I hope we have time to get to that uh, it's packaged and branded as inter ethnic uh, hatred when you're again uh, brought back to the same matrices uh, that started the war. Um, and um, uh, another thing uh, I wanted to say in terms of uh, Bosnian authoritarianisms, obviously they're unique due to their own Yugoslav history, due to their own unique uh, war and post-war situation, but they're intimately connected and articulated in convergence with um, larger global authoritarianisms in Europe, particularly since you have in Bosnia you have three presidents who are actually selected from uh, three ethnic groups. In Bosnia, you don't exist as an individual citizen. You cannot be a Bosnian. You have to be, you have to belong. Politically, you become visible only as a representative of an ethnic group. So each ethnic group um, uh, selects one of the members of the presidency, and each member of the, and they're all from the same nationalist party. There are basically six parties that are part of this um, kind of mess, of bureaucratic and political mess. Um, they have their own uh, authoritarian regime who are backing them and with which they're flirting. So in Republika Srpska you have, and I had that image where it's gone, you have Milorand Dodik who was celebrated by the U.S. Um, early on in his career as somebody who would stand up to the nationalist regime in Republika Srpska, Radovan Karadžić uh, and uh, Ratko Mladić. However, he turned his, uh, his speech and discourse and became actually a close Putin ally. Uh, right now, there's a huge support of Russia in Republika Srpska when it comes to police forces. They, military forces are unified, but police are not. There's a lot of exchange. Very recently, and this is again for Ryan, um, one of the deans uh, in Banja Luka in Republika Srpska uh, said that uh, Serbs are little Russians um, when they uh, welcomed one of the uh, Russian generals who came to visit. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you have the Bosniaks who are in very close alliance with uh, the Gulf states that are investing quite a lot, especially Saudi Arabia, in building not only the mosques and religious institutions, but also new uh, resorts um, by, you know, Olympic Village in Sarajevo is being basically now uh, refurbished into this huge res resort for tourists from the Balkan states, and this is the biggest investment in South Euro uh, Southeastern Europe. And finally, you have uh, Turkey that's also, uh, when, uh, um, uh, that's also, uh, is it Begovic, uh, one of the um, Muslim uh, Bosniak politicians, um, who's family basically has been in charge of the Muslim side of politics since the war. Uh, his father was Ali Izetbegovic and now uh, the son. Um, they are very close friends with uh, Erdogan, uh, who when he won, Izetbegovic said, um, 
Mr. President, you are not only the president of Turkey, you are the president of all of us. And um, the way in which Turkey's um, regime is present in the Balkans is through more softer kind of uh, types of, of power strategies where you have a lot of kind of investment in schooling, in education, uh, channeled through media, through press agencies, and through NGO work. And one final comment when it comes to the Russian influence, a lot of that is also done in the name of humanitarianism. Um, so there are quite a few centers that opened up uh, with Russian uh, kind of uh, backing in, in Serbia and, and Republika Srpska to prevent floods, but they're actually seen as spots for military kind of, um, not only training, but cooperation. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here. I have much more to say, but <laughs> no time. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, so, Demeter, the other kind of mothership, obviously, is supposed to be China, right, in terms of its, uh, the authoritarian example. And I'm curious how, if you could ex uh, explain how the Chinese leadership views itself and views, for instance, the press coverage. Uh, the New York Times has done a lot recently on uh, the surveillance state in China. Um, those are two kind of separate questions, but related. Can you kind of, some of those key features and how, if they view this as authoritarianism um, or how they actually, especially in the past we've talked a lot about peaceful, peaceful evolution um, and, and how that opposite, how the authoritarianism in China has been developed and in, in kind of as a regime protection against that, if you will. Um, okay. So let, let me try to respond to that. and I. Maybe in my response, I can also try and kind of touch on something that, that Brian and Latif also mentioned and kind of disagreed on um, concerning kind of the institutions of authoritarianism or, or democracy. But um, earlier, when you, when you used the term authoritarianism, you actually added a sentence at, or a, a phrase after that for the lack of a better term. Um, and and I, I, I do feel like we, it's, it's a problematic term. Um, what we mean by author, uh, authoritarianism is the pursuit of authority, right? uh, and the pursuit of authority of presumably an incumbent. Right? Um, and in, in that respect, I think all of us here have, have a lot in common. But beyond that, there's, a, there's different ways by which you can pursue authority. Um, you can pursue authority the Chinese way, which I would actually call a more totalitarian pursuit of authority, where you try to control everything, like a controlling parent tries to control everything their kids do and, and tracks them on GPS to see where they are, right? Um, or you can be authoritarian um, by, by um, dividing your opposition, um, setting people against, against one another and, and profiting from, from the discord. Uh, and I, I think that some of, the, some of the cases we refer to in the panel um, are, are better put in that category. Um, and there, there's other kinds of authoritarianism, which I think in the Russian case, I see it more as either you know, something like a kleptocracy or, or gangsterism, where it's about like which particular group everybody assumes is the most powerful. And in that respect, I think you know, the videos about corruption might even be helpful for the Putin group to, to, to demonstrate how effective they are in, in, in being so powerful. Um, but again, in that respect, you know, the authoritarianism, I, I think it's, it's, it's important to think about it that way. Is, um, can we define it in terms of the nature of the pursuit of power? And in the Chinese case, I think, you know, my, my impression is the Chinese Communist Party sees their pursuit of power as being one of total control. Um, and one being of total control for the pursuit of um, some of the benefits that you get from control, which includes stability, unity of what might otherwise be a much more divided um, Chinese state, um, and the pursuit of economic outcomes, nationalistic outcomes, um, great power outcomes. I think they see it that way. Um, and it's a, I think it's a different um, pursuit of power um, than, than um, a lot of other countries and, and cases where we might call authoritarian um, um, are, are placed. And kind of what they see in the Chinese model, I think, is different um, in, in that respect. But I, I don't think that the Chinese case is also that applicable uh, for those reasons, that those totalitarian reasons are not, they can't simply be adopted, e even though if Erdogan wants uh, to be um, a totalitarian like Xi Jinping, I don't think he can. Um, um, and I think it has to do a little bit with, with the fact that Turkey does have elections. And you know, I kind of see, I, I, I like to think of all the, my, my, my political science questions through metaphor or analogy, and I kind of see the relationship between state and society like the toothpaste inside a, a, a toothpaste tube. And democracy is like when you squeeze some of it out. 
you can't put it back in. And so as much as I think you know, the post-Soviet countries um, in Eastern Europe uh, or, or Turkey or um, um, Indonesia or wherever else where we're seeing kind of more uh, uh, movements towards more uh, uh, authority in the incumbents, um, institutions do stand in the way and prevent um, kind of where China is. And I think China, the Chinese Communist Party sees its um, um, mission of control as preventing that toothpaste from coming out because they know once it opens up, they, they can't put it back in. That's great, thank you. Thank you for connecting those dots too. Uh, Christine, just to pick up on, on Demeter's point, India offers, again, as, as you described, and Demeter brought up the videos that Brian had mentioned. So there's also this example that India likes to present itself as the largest democracy in the world, right? And how much does that actually play into the BJP's uh, attempts to kind of impose a different type of control or a different kind of rule in India by, by kind of obscuring, so the democratic elections obscuring what's actually going on underneath, including the targeting of minorities and registration. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, listening to, to you speak, it really helps to, I think, put the India case into context of that it's a much less direct way of pursuing power. Um, you know, because I don't think that, I mean, there are, there are elections, to some extent, there are protections to keep them somewhat free and fair. If you really drive down into a local context, there's a lot of debate around how free and fair those are. There are the presence of voting blocks, and, you know, there's a lot of complications there. But I think for the most part that, you know, what really characterizes what's happening in India right now is the growing um, impunity for kind of politically motivated groups to tamp down on minority, um, on minority causes and minority rights. So there's this kind of majoritarianism emerging, um, specifically from the Hindu right, um, that I think is... And I'm not even sure, I think, you know, I would love to hear more thoughts from the rest of you on how to actually phrase that in terms of, you know, authoritarianism or what does that actually look like in a formal pursuit of power because, no, it's not necessarily tied up with Modi, uh, Narendra Modi as a person because he is not um, necessarily an autocrat that is seeking to dismantle constitutional protections. Um, and it's also a long-running history. I mean, India has never... Um, been, even though it, ha it is very pluralistic, um, there's always been a lot of tension between groups. And especially depending on the state, um, there have been kind of, there's constitutional erosion around the protections of groups, especially in the Northeast and in Kashmir most notably. Um, so I think what we're seeing actually is kind of a leaching of some of that intolerance and some of these special laws um, that erode some of the constitutional protections around minorities in these border states coming into the heartland of the country. And when I say that, I'm thinking specifically of um, kind of the use of the Sedition Act um, more often against especially people that are supporting Kashmiri causes um, and anything that can be, be deemed anti-national. Anti-national has become a very, very popular word in India, um, and in particular to place charges, criminal charges against those who are speaking out against um, kind of the state narrative around whether or not uh, Kashmir is part of the Indian state or whether the Northeast is part of the Indian state. Um, so there's a lot of, I think, kind of interesting, almost going back to what Brian was saying as well about um, kind of the cleverness of, of keeping information kind of behind the veil in terms of co-opting um, different parts of civil society or co-opting narratives or, um, you know, kind of shrinking the space for media and uh, um, kind of space for civic discussion is that, you know, no, they're often not going out and, you know, committing assassinations. Like the state is not sponsoring violence, but it's allowing violence to flourish um, by its lack of um, speaking out against it. So, Latif, the, the, the idea of sedition is one that Erdogan has played on very well, right? Uh, particularly post coup, the, post, the failed coup attempt. Can you talk a little bit about, um, on the one hand, not only the broad crackdown and the use of this idea of, of external traitors, right, sponsored by the Julen movement, but then also the fact that you have a minority, this kind of, that's allowed him to combine in terms of the Kurds, that's allowed him to bring, to, to uh, combine with the military, the AKP and the military with this, you know, this hated minority, as well as kind of this internal enemy that he's also drawn on with uh, focusing on internal sedition. <clears throat> Around 1994, when Erdogan was 
running for Istanbul election and won. And he described democracy as a, as a bus. One is a necessary way to come to power. When you come to power, then you get out from that bus. And I think many people didn't understand and uh, give important value to that. What has so far he showed last 25 years, he, he stick with his promise. That when it comes to 2002 in power, he understands state very well. There were, there were three many op main oppositions. It was secular groups, which were militaries. Elite was behind that group. The second was, was the, the cleric religious uh, Gulen movement, which many other religious uh, you know, groups was there, but the main one was the Gulen movement. The third important power was in Turkey was the Kurdish movement. He understood that he cannot fight with two, these three at the same time. What exactly now, we, you know, uh, Dimitri just said, they, he managed to use coalition with some of them and then destroy one each by one. First, he went behind the secularist general here, the coalition with the Gulen movement, and by 2010, he already managed to get over all secular militaries, and he represents himself. He's better state supporters than these old seculars. And he proved that one as well. The later time, uh, he made coalition with Kurds. 2009 actually started that peace process, till 2013, 14. And then he went against religious Gulen movement, which actually conflict didn't start 2016, start 2012, November, when the, the religious movement established corruption uh, uh, case against Erdogan. And then when that one eliminated, he went to make coalition with his, the former general secularist group, nationalist, uh, you know, unitary perspective, 2015, against Kurds. Successfully, he has almost destroyed any institution in Turkey, which Dimitri said, if you have an institution, then you can come to something. But Turkey, there is not much institution and power left. Rule of law is nothing. Parliament is almost nothing. And now we have Sultan. But when you look at opposition parties, is as like sultans, but different son of sultan, which is ready, if he's replaced sultan, he's not going to make much difference than what sultan is doing. That's the reason Erdogan is not just Erdogan himself, create like Erdoganism, which is Kemalism was there as well. When somebody replaced Atatürk, he was almost acting like Atatürk. And that's the reason he, they keep, I mean like, uh, what just uh, Azra said about uh, Turkish relationship with the uh, uh, Balkans, not just with Balkans, down to Somalia and the uh, Middle East, the o Ottoman system, Ottomans as a state collapsed, but the mines is very present and active among all Turkish state. And as long as you manage this idea, you support this idea, if you look at Erdogan's speech, all his speech the, after the election, he start, today the win is not just for Ankara and Istanbul, it's for Mecca, for uh, uh, Belgrade, for Kosovo. He managed all these Ottomans, uh, you know, different um, uh, places. And I think that's leave almost no space for Turkey to recover from what has been created that one, become, as a way, rocky state, fragile state, what you know, we, see, we saw from Saddam perspective or Gaddafi perspective, when they're gone, and there was not any institution, which was a problem, not because of keeping Saddam there, that wasn't because the Western managed to keep institutions, but Turkey today, I think we don't, well, we don't have much institutions. The opposition today, there's a rise of between the who is in power, who is second wants to be in power. Both are very right-wing nationalities. And if you look at the CHP's recent uh, candidates, 
the videos are very ultra nationalities, very almost fascist, because they uh, make very openly videos. How much, if they come to power, they will get rid of all these Syrian refugees. They will limit all they benefit from the state. They will do ABC, because that kind of uh, space doesn't leave much for Kurds, even women movement, which is very progressive, but uh, there is not much space for them. I think just last one word I would like to say, Turkey, while they politically or economically follow Western perspective, not just from today, from even Ottoman perspective, as a food always been Western, but mind always has followed Russia. The leadership in Turkey always has a, some connection with Russia. If you look at the Lenin's come to power, Atatürk follow come to power and follow this almost similar methods. But the Putin's, when you start his power in 1998, uh, 2000, then later time, Turkey. Always, a, you know, I believe that if there is any real progress change in Turkey, we, we might look at the Russia first. If dem without democracy come to Russia, I think we won't face any democracy in Turkey. Um, so this allows us to shift to kind of the last part, which is looking at, building on that, opportunities for resistance on the ground, opposition. Um, and we can begin with, with Russia, because apparently you're going to be the hope for the world. So this is, this is, uh, this is where it begins. But um, can you talk a little bit about that? One, on the one hand, what does opposition look like in these kind of, we talked about strategies of resistance, and then two, is there a changing view of democracy uh, in Russia? Um, because of Putin's rule or because of the opposition? Uh, I'm going to start with the second part first in terms of changing view of democracy. So uh, it's frequently said and maybe even sometimes apparently believed that Russians have some kind of natural predisposition towards authoritarianism, right? Uh, I think the evidence for that is very weak, and political scientists have studied this quite closely. Um, now, it is true that if you ask Russians what they think the democracy means in open-ended questionnaires, uh, about a third of them will basically s refuse to answer or say they don't know, right? But I, I don't know if you'd get a better response if you asked random people on the street in lots of countries, I guess. But So the, the ones who answer, their, their first answer is a component of democracy, uh, which is uh, civil liberties and rights. Um, but also quite high on the list is material prosperity. That's what people thought democracy was bringing them when um, they supported it in the early 1990s. And the, the political science answer right, uh, about uh, sort of free and fair elections comes like less than 10% of the population mention that when they think about. So it's about rights and freedoms, it's about power to the people, and it's about prosperity, but not necessarily about institutions. They don't kind of think about it in that way when asked, at least in public opinion surveys. Um, now, in terms of sort of strategies of resistance, I, I mentioned already some of the kind of more li liberal and democratic elements. There are also um, some left-wing movements that um, are, are relatively sympathetic to democracy. They have the problem that the the political space is occupied by the remnants of the Communist Party. The, it's now called the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, which has had the same leader for uh, more than 20 years now and is quite sympathetic to the Kremlin, and the Kremlin likes it that way, right? And then on the sort of nationalist right, part of the spectrum. They also have the so-called Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which is neither liberal nor democratic and is headed by this demagogue Zhirinovsky, who's also been around for uh, almost 30 years now, right? Uh, so one of the things that the regime has done is tried to prevent the rise of alternatives, right, at, at the national level. Um, some of the alternatives have left. Um, some of the alternatives have been killed. Uh, some of the alternatives are around and harassed. Uh, but if we look um, at what's going on, we do see, um, you know, at local level, lots of protests, lots of activity, and that sort of thing. And, and a lot of these protests aren't about political issues. So the biggest protests last year were about the plan to raise the pension age. Uh, but lots of people came out on the street about that. The, the biggest source of protest right now at the local level is about garbage, actually. Uh, because big companies from Moscow are taking over local garbage. Uh, sort of disposal and building inadequate 
uh, facilities for dealing with it, and so it's polluting the water and stuff like that. So people come out about things like that. And those people who sort of track that kind of issue uh, see not only um, a persistence of those types of protests, but growing kind of protests. And it's not surprising because average living standards have declined for the last five years, and there's no real prospect for renewed growth unless world energy prices change dramatically. So uh, there is, I think, a growing sense at the popular level that Putinism is kind of running its course, but there's also no obvious exit because they prevented the rise uh, of any kind of alternative. So I'm not predicting this, but I would also not rule out that either some effort to cut off Russia from the internet or some move towards extending Putin's power beyond 2024 would lead a lot of this socioeconomic discontent to become more politicized. Azra, do you want to talk about? Uh... Sure. Um, so immediately after the war, I think there was a lot of excitement about the prospects of democracy and uh, the Dayton Peace Agreement that created this monstru uh, monstrous, I call it, cannibalistic state which eats its own people, um, uh, was supposed to be a temporary solution. However, that temporary solution became a permanent solution. And every time there is any pressure to change the Dayton Peace Agreement that locks people into these ethnic uh, buckets, that's seen as an attack used by these ethnocrats, uh, as an attack uh, on democracy itself. Um, so they're kind of uh, playing, playing the discourse in order to eliminate any kind of opposition to uh, change the constitution itself. So that leaves the majority of people caught in this space in which they feel, um, they think that democracy in principle is okay, but their own version of democracy is deeply flawed. Um, which leads to a certain kind of, so I'll, I'll just mention kind of four tendencies. One is that they, uh, there's a gr growing anti-citizenship. I call it anti-citizenship, which is kind of detachment of especially young people, these are the people I studied, from the state itself. Because they have all these levels of governance and they, the state it seems very removed from their, from their everyday lives. Um, they don't, there's no sense of really Bosnianhood. Um, rather, their identification is with these sub-states, uh, sub-state levels. So state becomes empty, even though it's so huge. Uh, this anti-citizenship becomes a kind of agentive, active withdrawal from state, from politics, from official politics. So what the majority of young people are doing is they're, even though they're described as kind of um, lazy or uh, disinterested, actually they're kind of agentively withdrawing from that politics, thinking about who they will have coffee with today, and thinking about how they will become democratic citizens elsewhere, in some imagined Europe or somewhere else. Uh, every the time between that these two spaces it collapses. There's no there's no vision of what should happen. So there's a lot of this kind of suspended active waiting. Um, so I call that anti citizenship. Um, the, the, the only way in which opposition articulates itself, because the process is so ethnicized and there is no incentive to create any kind of inter-trans-ethnic, inter-ethnic, trans-ethnic uh, coalitions, um, is to take the streets. And Bosnians have been taking the streets. Uh, the first time in 2013, when due to ethnic uh, bickering, um, uh, the, uh, the government failed to issue, um, to issue this unique, um, uh, master citizen number, which every citizen has to get in order to get a passport. Because of this kind of uh, uh, frozen um, internal politicking, um, they were not issuing that for a while, which resulted in uh, a new citizen being, citizens being born, but made invisible immediately because they didn't get this number. But it led to death of certain babies that supposed to receive treatment elsewhere, they couldn't leave the country, the protests erupted, uh, erupted people took the streets. That died out after a couple of months. Then a year later, in 2014, Bosnian Spring happens, and it surprised the majority of the world, not the people who know, and it articulated itself around class. And uh, the fact that Bosnia is post-socialist is often eliminated in scholarship as well, because we are so much focused on ethno-nationalism and post-war and all these discourses that are, to some extent, suffocating uh, you know, both imagination and, and, and politics. And what, what happened is that uh, unemployed youth, uh, pensioners took the streets in huge numbers. 
Um, and that was um, the international community that basically has been in charge of much of Bosnian post-war life. I was shocked by that because this was not a grammar that they recognized. There's no, uh, there's no, there, it was not, it was purposefully not ethnic. And um, without the support of the international community and, and due to all sorts of, again, political games, this, this ended. Um, and the protest ended and a lot of disillusionment happened because the protest didn't uh, succeed, even though the protest started by unemployed workers who are perpetually waiting um, and to, to be employed, um, and uh, from, from unemployed youth and pensioners. And finally, the biggest protest is happening right now, and that protest is people leaving the country. Uh, Bosnia is, is losing its youth in, in numbers that are Truly, to some people who are alarming, it, um, some, it, it, I've read most recently that in the last uh, five years, uh, more than 300,000 people left, which for the country is 3.2 million people is a huge number. Um, so that's the protest. Now, uh, they're, not, they're not anymore waiting, they're not suspended, they're just leaving. And mm -hmm. even though you know, the biggest news about Bosnia in, in the uh, popular press was Karadzic got the life sentence, Mladic uh, is in prison for life, when I call people and what they talk about is another bus of youth left and no one is crying. They're leaving, right? So this is the story on the ground. Um, so I'll end that there. Demeter, do you want to talk about the, the Chinese possibilities for opposition and if there's any connections to what Osram is describing about a brain drain or a youth drain and, and what Brian has described about kind of the official, official opposition that may be as, as bad as the existing regime? Um, okay. So... I, I don't think that we're experiencing a, a, a brain drain in China right now. Um, so I, I, maybe I'll not try not to answer that. But in terms of like you know prospects for the future or opposition, I, I think the prospects for democracy in China are, are quite low. Um, and I, I don't know the best way to describe this. So um, the political scientist Joseph Nye coined this term um, um, "soft power" in 1990. And the, the basic idea is that you, know, you can, you can kind of get the rest of the world or others or whoever it is, your children, your students, to do what you want without forcing them to do it or without kind of preaching it to them. Um, in, in Bulgaria in the 1980s, and I think this was true in, in Russia um, and, and in China, kind of the allure of democracy was, was quite strong. Um, because people saw it through the lens of soft power. They saw it through Coca-Cola. They saw it through Hollywood. And kind of one of the ironies of the Cold War is that it kind of, you know, un you know removed the cover, unpeeled so, so the, kind of the, the layer between what, what people um, uh, thought about democracy and, and some of the realities. And some of the realities are difficult. Democracy doesn't naturally translate into prosperity, peace, um, and, and, and um, unity among the people. Sometimes it can be violent, sometimes it can be problematic. And I, I don't know if that's what's driving it, but interest in democracy among the Chinese people, uh, according to surveys, has been going down perpetually. Um, and so people even who are dissatisfied with the regime, and um, I've done this even in survey experiments to try and, and get people angry at the regime, um, their response is not that they want more democracy. Um, and so if you're missing that kind of underlying demand, I, I don't see how whatever happens could, could come in and provide that as a supply. Now that doesn't mean that, I, you know, that, that the, the Chinese regime or anything is, is, is uh, um, um, bulletproof. Um, I think it has a lot of weaknesses. And I think it has uh, some of the weaknesses, the ones that I, 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 I believe exist most are similar to what Azra mentioned, is this kind of anti-citizenship. Um, that people are um, becoming, in, in an awkward, in, in, again, in an ironic way, disconnected from, from, the, from the party and from the state, even though they are connected digitally all the time. Um, it's it, this kind of this passive surveillance, this passive Leninist control that the Chinese Communist Party has, has put together is, in, in, in some sense, very successful in terms of providing them the information they need to be able to uh, uh, put down any sort of opposition. But it does it, it's almost so successful that I think that they're, they're under-investing in kind of the more traditional political mobilization that, that, that built the party up in, in the past and sustained it. Um, and so, again, I, I, in terms of the future, I don't see democracy, uh, but that doesn't mean I, I see kind of sustained CCP dominance. 
But what's interesting is what you just described also takes us back to spring of 89, where you said that they had failed to kind of invest in this kind of grassroots, yes. and you almost see this return to that, which is interesting. Christine, India is a somewhat hopeful case because we, to your point earlier, we haven't gone the full authoritarian road. You want to talk about some of the opposition, including from human rights and civil society organizations, including not just the monitoring, but but the challenge of the BJP and some of its uh, some of its policies. Yeah. So um, I think you know, just to kind of reiterate some of my earlier points. Um, you know, I think you know there's always been a culture of protest in India. Um, it's a very, it has always had a very vibrant civil society, and part of kind of the concern and the shock um, around the country right now is the fact that that space appeared to be shrinking, and that really unnerved a lot of people. Um, so in 2014 and 2015, for example, it even, even Richard Verma, who was the uh, U.S. ambassador to India at the time, expressed his concern officially about the chilling effect on civil society and media in India. And we can see that also continuing along with mainstream media in India, especially with broadcast. Um, several CNN and IBN journalists, prominent journalists, have left because of kind of the nationalistic um, co-optation of some of the main media houses in India. Um, and some of them do allege, and I, I, this hasn't, I have not studied this, but according to some of the people that have worked in some of those newsrooms, you know, they allege government intervention as well into some of the, the media um, that is mainstream right now. And you can see this especially in the coverage of the recent attack in Kashmir where 40 or 50 um, Indian military were killed. Um, so all of that to say there's concern about the homogenization of discourse in the country. That being said, I think it's very important to remember that India is a huge country. And there are places where the state is very strong, and there are places where the state is very weak. And so I think when we talk about, you know, is there a backslide into illiberalism, or is there a backslide into, you know, backslide of democracy, is that, um, at, you know, I think the elections at this point are going to be extremely crucial in figuring out what is going to be the future trajectory of the country. Um, so we'll find out on May 23rd. Um, and so I think, you know, if we can, if we can see evidence that, um, you know, elections at a local level uh, have adequate protections to be free and fair and seeing how the coalitions turn out, I think to a certain extent we can see whether or not there will be a repudiation of the current trend or a strengthening of the current trend. Um, and then to your last point about the BJP and specifically some of its policies, um, there is a thriving online community. Some of the um, kind of local resistance uh, groups, especially in the Northeast and Kashmir, their internet is surveilled at a heavier rate than the rest of the country, um, and often their internet will get shut down during times of protest. Um, curfews will be put in place, heavily militarized. So you do see kind of a different uh, manifestation of some of this intolerance uh, in certain areas of the country more than others. Um, so in places like that, it's very difficult to push back against some of the um, current administration's policies, especially um, recently in Kashmir with kind of the multi-week curfews that were put down. Um, but in other places in the country, in Bangalore, in Delhi, in Calcutta, in Mumbai, I mean, these are places where, um, you know, we do see growing arrests of protesters, but people are still coming out onto the streets. And so I do think that India is a very hopeful case, um, but I do think that the outcome of this election is going to be crucial. Latif, if you want to close this out, I mean, it's you had already mentioned that you you don't see much opposition anymore because so many institutions have been really kind of eliminated by Erdogan. But if you want to, if you can talk a little bit about what what possibilities may exist for resistance and how that could be evidenced and, and what possibilities exist, you, you've been very active on the Kurdish front, um, especially for Americans to to assist. That would be great. In Turkey, if we there is a strong Kurdish resistance, it has been always there and still there, even though. Most of the political leaders, representative activists, thousands of them are prison, even actually present days, almost 3,000, they are in hunger strike. Some of them over, over 100 days already. There is already active resistance in different shapes from Kurdish movements continue. And there are also strong women movement in Turkey as well. We cannot underestimate this one. And like when 100,000 of them go to the street and stay against authoritarian regimes because the regimes in Turkey always has been body politics and women uh, sexuality has been part of the politics and uh, good mothering or others. Others has been attacked by the state authority. And these are, have been there. But when we look at the large Turkish public, the 
AKP, the government party, Erdogan's party, very successfully, they used charity system, which is old Ottoman charity system, which is the help of the municipalities, and to reaching almost every household, to giving them anything from the taxpayers' money, but providing this one as a as a Erdogan's or party's government money, as, as a bringing way, the state is equal of AKP, government party, like a communist party equal state type of things, which is becoming untouchable way. You know, you cannot touch and criticize state, and you cannot touch and criticize this kind of AKP. Also, Turkey historically there is not actually strong protest movement, when we put aside like Gezi movement 2013, historically the state always has been very important on obeying the rule of the state and the leader of the state has been the main dominant. This has been the tradition since Ottomans. Uh, and I th but we also have seen the changes in, in Turkey because Erdogan managed to continue this charity system and strengthen his power with that kind of uh, alternative economic model. But now, economy is going worse. And then, two, after 2016, what he did, he grabbed all these Guyanese Islamists, uh, he positioned people's wealth, he transferred into states. And he used this wealth part of the economic, like his uh, charity advantage. They, he has uh, two options from here to do if the economy continue bad. Once he can go after somebody's people wealth, some minorities wealth, because previous in, um, 1950s, some Greeks minorities wealth was transferred. In the early version, there was Semitic Armenians and Jewish wealth was transferred to state. But uh, I don't know, this could be different groups, because uh, between 2002, 2007, there were certain business people's wealth was transferred, one of them, the main opposition leaders who escaped to France after that. Uh, I think one thing can increase people's uh, criticism will be economy. You know, in different ways, as I always say, Turkish people like Scots, uh, once you don't touch the pocket, they won't do anything else, even they see the 100,000 people dead on the street. Because it uh, doesn't matter have anything to happen, curse is not going to affect the western part of Turkey because it's not a matter. Actually, it's even unitary them. And women, still Turkish, very patriarchal societies, and actually, women's rights hasn't been even deepened by the, their own families, by people as well. And I think only maybe economic. Uh, perspective and also some other uh, global trends might change the dimension in Turkey. But once in Turkey change, it doesn't change very softly. It changed very radically. That's great. And that also ties us back into the beginning, uh, the first panel where we talked about some of the economic, economic pressures in Eastern Europe that may have linked uh, not only to the collapse of, the, of uh, communist rule, but then also the rising uh, nationalism of the past decade. So we have time for one or two questions. Why don't I open it up and, and before we wrap up. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask the panel? Robert? Um, this idea of, um, I wanted to challenge the idea that you can't put the toothpaste back in the <laughs> tube, because I, 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 uh, you know, I don't want to be that German historian that brings up the Nazis, but, but I mean, I think that, you know, Germany is a country that did have democratic institutions, and, um, you know, much like Erdogan, Hitler came to power in the bus, right, of democracy. And um, so I guess, I don't know if there's a question there, but I wanna kind of pull on that a little bit and see what happens because I'm not, I'm not so sure that um, democratic institutions defend themselves. Um, and I think, I, I also, yeah, well, I'll leave it at that, so for the sake of time. Okay, um, thank you, Robert. Um, so, just to clarify, I, I didn't mean that the democratic institutions defend themselves. 
I, in, in, instead, what I, I meant is that they perpetuate themselves in terms of the pursuit of power, such that once you open up society into a democratic format, the nature of, of power and competition is going to be structured around those rules. It may be unfair, um, um, elections may be stolen, but you will still be competing in that type of space. Um, and it will, whatever happens to Erdogan or whoever comes forward, they're still going to be stuck with the fact that people are going to expect elections and they're going to have to figure out a way to disenfranchise them and, and win them uh, without losing. And that's a very different type of authoritarianism, I think, than a Leninist type of authoritarianism that maybe um, Ataturk originally um, envisioned, uh, that Lenin definitely envisioned, Stalin to some extent perfected, and, and, and Mao revolutionized. Right? Uh, that type of, that type of uh, uh, attempt to control is one that's all within the tube. And that, that's kind of what I meant by these institutions. Once they're out, um, um, you can't get rid of them. You can, you can corrupt them. You can try and defraud them. Um, but you, 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 it's hard to cancel them. You can delay them with a military junta for a couple of years like Thailand did, but eventually you have to hold them. Um, and you hold them when you, when you think you can win them. But it, it does, in my, in my impression, in my kind of empirical perspective, I've never seen uh, these, these types of institutions um, uh, removed wholesale once they've been, they've been put in place. Robert, your description of the toothpaste is interesting because uh, there was a second strong Turkish leader, uh, Ismet Inunu. He actually once, 1960s, mentioned exactly what you just, uh, uh, you know, he told his son, once, you know, toothpaste come out, you cannot put back. And his son, it was 1990s, was a politician, and he was also a physicist. He was actually uh, teaching uh, at one of the best universities in Turkey. And one of, he was described, there was a discussion at the TV about, you know, the democratic values. And he said, actually, my father was wrong when he mentioned that toothpaste, you know, cannot be reversed, but I have seen that it's reversed. He was critical of his own father, Erdal Ininu. And yes, when easily, you know, democratic values and, uh, and the multiple, uh, uh, ideologies or uh, rule of like, can be destroyed by the, uh, any authoritarian regimes. But in Turkey, for example, in tomorrow, if the Erdogan or, you know, if stated uh, this ethnic group is dangerous for the state, the following day you will see millions of people go after them and destroy their uh, houses and grab their wealth, which was happened actually in uh, 2015, in many Turkish cities, when they start a uh, conflict against Kurds, even many innocent Kurdish people in western part of Turkey, their business was destroyed. They, people start being attacked by the state as well, because uh, state forces, uh, sorry, public as well. Uh, I think there is not any rule of law, for example, in Turkey to, to go after, you know, criticize Erdogan or any groups who, who fit this kind of hate uh, propaganda. Um, when Erdogan mentioned about um, you know academics who signed the petition, I am the, also one of these uh, people who signed the petition. Um, you know, 1,200 people simply just criticize what state taking position without without active involvement any uh, street protests or anything else, which is very simple, basic. Uh, individual protests, you can sign some petition, criticize government position, but it hasn't stopped from that Erdogan, and many public people start actually criticizing that academics. The doors was uh, signed by the uh, other students, and they were attacked, and people had to escape the uh, country as a way of, uh, you know, uh, keeping alive, because these kind of regimes, very mafiatic, uh, action they have as well, as like uh, in Germany in the uh, late uh, 30s happened, the youth of the Hitlers or uh, different groups went behind, the, they were attacking every na different neighborhoods, but state didn't do anything else because state was protesting, uh, supporting this kind of regime. Similar things you can see exactly in Turkey, but there is not any judge to take decision against anybody who are not proved by Erdogan. 
Great. Well, thank you for coming. We'll be back at 2 o'clock for the third panel. Thanks so much, everybody. This is great.